Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's stream uh, on WebAssembly. Uh, thank you for joining, tuning in, and uh, I'm, I'll be waiting a couple of minutes, and we'll talk in that couple of minutes so that a uh, few folks join. Uh, so this is live streaming on uh, YouTube and Twitch. Uh, you can join anywhere. The recording will be available after the session. Make sure you uh, 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 ask questions during the uh, presentation discussion. Uh, you can just ask your questions because that is the time I, I try to answer all the questions. Uh, and uh, uh, today uh, we'll be talking about WebAssembly. So, uh, like, and I have very special guest uh, with me as well, uh, Connor. So we'll do the introductions and everything just in a moment. Uh, so thank you all for tuning in uh, for today. I'm uh, Sayyam, and uh, this is my YouTube channel where you are seeing it. And uh, uh, if you are on Twitch, then that is my Twitch channel. Uh, so make sure you hit the subscribe buttons on both of them. And uh, because I keep on bringing this, uh, these uh, streams, cloud native streams, and uh, uh, exciting things in open source community. And I also post sometimes uh, uh, some short videos uh, that that can help on any of the open source products. I'm a CNCF ambassador, uh, director of technical evangelism at CIVO. And uh, uh, yeah, I love cloud native things and I keep doing them, love open source and uh, try to keep contributing. So today's topic is very interesting and uh, I'm excited about it and I'm sure you are too. So today we'll be talking completely about WebAssembly uh, and uh, Suborbital, what are its projects, uh, a demo, uh, and uh, we'll also be seeing some of the industry standards. Where is industry moving in in the WebAssembly space, uh, which would be interesting to see and discuss. Uh, so uh, that that pretty that's pretty much it that uh, today's agenda is. Uh, so introduction to WebAssembly, uh, would, it's, it's quite interesting uh, as a topic as well. It has uh, picked up uh, its space uh, now, and uh, it, it's very been very popular. So we'll discuss like why it is important, why it is important now, and why you should be learning. Uh, and uh, I have a very special guest, uh, Connor, uh, with me. So uh, Connor is uh, the maintainer of the Suborbital, and he's the staff developer at One Password as well. Uh, so thank you, Connor, for joining uh, today's stream. Uh, would you like to introduce more uh, on yourself and just say hi to everyone? Sure. Hello. Thank you very much for having me. I'm pretty excited to show off some some of the cool things that WebAssembly can do. Um, if you want to throw up the slides, I can maybe talk, do a little bit more of an introduction. Yeah. Yeah. Sure. I'll drop those. Slides. So basically, uh, to all those people who are here for WebAssembly, and you know, you want to just get started. Uh, yes, I know you are excited to hear Connor. So WebAssembly, just to set the context. Um, so WebAssembly is kind of you know a, a browser based uh, running running your code uh, browser based, but it, it it's not JavaScript. Uh, so WebAssembly uh, makes it's it's kind of a lightweight virtual machine, uh, very fast, and you don't program uh, in in WebAssembly. Basically, it's not something that you program. It's meant to be like a, a cr cross compiled uh, thing. So you you cross compile stuff from from different languages like Go, Rust, C, C plus plus, and then uh, then you are able to run that particular piece of code uh, in in web browser. So that's pretty much exciting. Uh, I'm excited to hear about the use cases. Uh, why would would we need uh, you know WebAssembly when we already have JavaScript? I know it's not there to replace JavaScript, but it's basically for the some of the uh, performances and some of the specific use cases that you know WebAssembly is very very robust and uh, kind of uh, getting adopted uh, very much by the community, and it's it's short form. I mean, it's uh, often called as Wasm. Am I right? That's right. Yeah. So so it's often called as Wasm, and uh, so CNCF also has a cloud native Wasm day. I mean, you can see the adoptability. Uh, you know uh, how the community is uh, adopting. So uh, when when you have a, such a, a event at such a big level, uh, that shows like how critical and important piece of the cloud native ecosystem it has become now. So uh, without wasting uh, now any other time, uh, let's uh, hear it from Connor. So Connor, what is WebAssembly and what we are uh, here to discuss today? Yeah, absolutely. So you gave a great introduction. Uh, you got all the key points there. Um, WebAssembly was originally designed to be sort of, they called it the fourth language of the web browser. And there has been a lot of adoption uh, in that respect. But even more recently, there's been adoption outside of the browser as well. 
Um, and that's one of the common misconceptions that people have about WebAssembly is that it is only for the browser. Now, there are some really incredibly cool use cases in the browser, but that's not what I do. I don't build WebAssembly tools for the browser. I build WebAssembly tools for cloud native applications. And I'll talk a little bit about what that means in just a second. Um, so yes, my name is Connor. Uh, I work at 1Password, and I've been building Suborbital for uh, about a year and a half to two years now. And um, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to walk through you know, why WebAssembly is a you know, interesting new technology, uh, what it allows you to do, uh, why is it useful in a cloud native you know, application, uh, and then you know we'll maybe talk about some other things in the industry, some other projects that are you know becoming popular, and we'll also talk about um, you know just what's next, what is going to be happening in the future, um, and I'll also give a demo. Um, so the the problem that that suborbital particularly is trying to solve is the massive complexity that has arisen in the last you know, five, 10 years uh, with the architecture of cloud native applications. You know, microservices have made everything more powerful, but also much more difficult to build. You have to put a lot more uh, effort and design time and you know, person hours and et cetera into building these microservice based applications. And so, I wanted to design a system that would give you a lot of the benefits of microservices while keeping the complexity of what you're building very low. So how do we do that? So there are four points that I kind of use as rules when I'm building suborbital. And those rules are, we're building for a future based on WebAssembly. Uh, we're going to embody the SUFA design pattern, which I'll talk about in a second. Uh, we're going to embrace rising software trends, such as edge computing, because I think edge computing is a pretty fascinating new topic. And we are going to enforce scalable architecture and security by making it hard to screw up. That's one of my, one of my favorite things to say, is making it hard to screw something up. So um, first, we'll talk about WebAssembly. And you know, it was, like I said, originally designed to run in the web browser, but in the last couple of years, we have seen the WebAssembly specification used in runtimes outside of the browser. So V8, which is the Chrome uh, JavaScript engine, it fully supports WebAssembly, and that's what allows it to run in the browser. And you are able to bind JavaScript to it. You're allowed to call WebAssembly code from JavaScript and vice versa. And you can share memory, and you can access browser APIs, et cetera, using code that was compiled to WebAssembly. Um, but the, the funny thing about WebAssembly is that it is neither web or assembly. <laughs> it's, it's an interesting little uh, tool because it is completely agnostic as to where it runs. WebAssembly itself is a bytecode format that describes an application. It is you know, a target for compiling a programming language to. And that specification can be run anywhere. So uh, you know, it started in the browser, but then these other runtimes started to appear. So some of the common ones are called WASM time, WASMer, Lucid, WASM3. Uh, Wavum. There's a there's a number of these standalone WebAssembly interpreters and runtimes available, and what these allow us to do is take the same benefits of WebAssembly that you know from the browser and apply them in other places. So those benefits are, you know, near native performance, uh, the ability to have polyglot applications all running, you know, in the same application. Uh, the tight sandboxing and security properties that is kind of considered denied by default, meaning that the WebAssembly code is denied access to everything outside of its own sandbox unless you explicitly give it access to certain things. 
And so all of these properties make it really compelling for both the web browser and something running on a server. Um, a classic example, and, and it's funny because you had the GraalVM um, episode recently where a lot of the similar topics were covered, right? But the ability for you to write an application in one particular language and then maybe even have your users provide code to customize or script uh, using WebAssembly and you can run it much more safely and not worry as much about the security implications of that code because of the tight sandbox and because of the security properties and how WebAssembly was designed. Um, so then there's this SUFA design pattern, and this is something that I've been developing alongside the suborbital projects, and that is simple, unified, function-based applications. That's what that stands for. And really what this boils down to is a way of designing cloud-native applications to be scalable, easy to write, and not complicated. So just quickly running through what those four letters mean, simple just means that you don't have to deploy dozens or hundreds of different things to interconnect in order to run your application. You, you simply need to deploy like a simple, um, maybe an auto scaling group or maybe a single Kubernetes pod and your entire application will be there. Um, and unified means that uh, the result of building your application is a single deployable unit. So in the case of Atmo, which we'll look at soon, that is what we call an application bundle. And so you only have to deploy one thing. You don't have to build a whole bunch of Docker images. You don't have to build you know, a whole bunch of binaries and deploy them all separately. You just build one thing. And then function-based is exactly what it sounds like. We're designing the applications around single functions that are composed to build an application. And that's what the A stands for, is application. And in this context, application simply refers to an entire thing, an entire app. You shouldn't have um, you know, one service serving many apps. It should be very straightforward, one program serving one application. Um, and then, you know, trends like edge computing, I think, are really fascinating. We're not going to get too much time to talk about that today. But, you know, the ability to run code on a network that is much closer to the end user than your central cloud or your central Kubernetes cluster is really quite fascinating. And WebAssembly lends itself perfectly to that use case. Uh, because it is so small, it is so lightweight, and it has such good performance that pushing it out to an edge network and allowing it to run um, you know, right there near the user is one of the most compelling parts. And if we have time, I'll actually touch on how we can even push it a little bit past edge computing. Um, and then making, making uh, scalability and security hard to screw up is something that I like uh, to talk about. Because when it comes to scalability and security, you don't, you can't afford to screw up, right? Uh, if your application, you know, if you have some big event that happens and your your cloud native app goes down, your business, you know, is is affected, your reputation is affected, all of these things uh, go wrong, and the same thing goes for security. I come from a security background, and so you know, it's extremely important to me that. You know, every layer of the stack has security built into its core. And no matter how you deploy it, no matter how you run it, no matter how you configure something, you should not be able to run it in an insecure manner. That's kind of the, the idea, is that no matter what configuration you use, it will always be secure. Um, so that brings us to the actual suborbital projects and I'll just cover them really quickly. We're going to focus on Atmo today, but there are a few other ones that if anybody's interested, you can go check out. Um, so Atmo is the, you know, I call it the flagship uh, because it is kind of the focus of Suborbital. It is the main project that, you know, I've been spending most of my time on. And that is an entirely, um, you know, batteries included um, 
platform and framework for building cloud native applications with WebAssembly. So what this means is it gives you all of the libraries, all of the APIs, the runtime, all of the tools needed to build and run a WebAssembly application in the cloud. Everything you need is included with the Atmo project. And we'll talk a whole lot about it, I'm sure, very soon. And then there are the other three projects. And they are what I call the building blocks, because uh, they are actually the components that make Atmo. So a Vector is an, is an HTTP framework. Grav is a messaging bus that allows for asynchronous communication. And then Reactor is a function scheduler. So this is actually the core of Atmo. And it is what's responsible for running WebAssembly. Uh, it creates a multi-tenant WebAssembly execution environment, meaning that you can load many, many WebAssembly modules, like dozens or hundreds or even thousands of WebAssembly modules into the Reactor scheduler, and it will allow you to run those modules very efficiently with very high performance. Um, are there any questions that we might want to pause and answer? Yeah, uh, so basically, when you said um, uh, uh, this is server side uh, WebAssembly and we have uh, like different runtime, so op I mean, initially it was only for the browser based uh, uh, to run the code in the browser, uh, different from other than JavaScript. So it, you can uh, basically it's a byte code that you can run. And uh, so now when you talk that there are different runtimes uh, that helps you create the applications uh, easily. And uh, so how do we tell a person, um, like say a person is there and he wants to understand, or they wants to understand like what exactly they can do with WebAssembly, uh, be it server side, uh, or let's take server side itself, and there are different run times, then what you can actually do. Say that there's a Go programmer and they want to understand what exactly they can do with WebAssembly uh, uh, with the, all the run times available and how, how they pick and choose which run times are good for what, because it's it's something which is, uh, uh, like you said, there are different run times already there. So it can be confusing for people like uh, who are just entering into the field of WebAssembly, like what, what exactly to look for and where to look for. So can you Absolutely. Uh, tell that? Yeah, for sure. So for somebody who's getting started, um, I would suggest experimenting in the browser because that is the easiest way to get started. Um, but if you are looking to build, you know, WebAssembly outside of the server or outside of the browser, I should say. Um, the, the best way to get started, um, the easiest one to get started with that, I, in my opinion, is Wasmer, W-A-S-M-E-R. That's what Reactor uses internally. Um, and they just reached 1.0, so it's a very mature WebAssembly runtime. Um, and the way that you would want to choose which runtime is best for you is by comparing uh, you know, things like their performance and the uh, specifications from the WebAssembly community that they are compatible with. Uh, because WebAssembly is a young ecosystem, not everything is supported in every runtime. So depending on the capabilities that you need to build your application, you may not be able to use one runtime or another because they don't support everything that you need. So I would very much suggest saying, you know, oh, if I need to do machine learning, the SSVM project is very, you know, dedicated to machine learning, and they also do a lot with the blockchain. So if those are the kinds of, you know, applications that you're looking to build, that is a more, you know, uh, intentional choice than say a more general runtime like Wasmer or Wasm Time. Um, and to get started, uh, I would I would suggest starting with Rust. It is the language with the best support for WebAssembly. Now, I know Rust has a, quite a learning curve. I've experienced that myself. Um, so if you are coming from the web browser and you are, you know, uh, your, your experience is more with JavaScript and TypeScript, I would recommend looking at AssemblyScript because it is a TypeScript variant that was specifically designed for WebAssembly. And they give you all of the tooling that you would need to build WebAssembly using a language that you might be more familiar with. Um, for Go in particular, uh, the, the support for WebAssembly, it, it varies. Uh, 
there is a project called TinyGo that I would recommend you look at. They have a custom WebAssembly target for TinyGo that actually is a little bit more advanced, a little bit further along than the proper Go toolchain. Um, and they have specific support for the latest WebAssembly standards. And so if you are a Go developer, looking at TinyGo would be definitely recommended. Um, and you know the, the important thing to know is that WebAssembly by design is very restricted, right? And so as you get started with it, don't expect to be able to build every single thing that you're used to building with WebAssembly because it is designed to be locked down and very secure. And that's something that we're going to look at um, in a few minutes is how the suborbital tooling allows you to build some of the things that you're used to using our runnable API, which is providing capabilities to the WebAssembly sandbox that are you know, meant to be used to build cloud native applications. Yeah, I mean that that was some grateful insight on like a person you know uh, coming in and they want to get in uh, from different domains like from a programming background and from a, a browser based programming background uh, where to start and you know what to look for. Uh, now that I have uh, say that I have chosen uh, a particular maybe Vasmer, um, like I want to get started with that and uh, I rush programming. So uh, the, the question that might arise in the mind is uh, I can write a code in Go or in Python. And now what extra benefit I will have if I use uh, the, the one of the, you know, uh, like the Vasmer or any other uh, these of, of the frameworks. So uh, what would this give me the extra extra uh, edge? Uh, because I can build an application, a cloud native application using Go. And uh, uh, now, if I want to use uh, the one of the web WebAssembly, uh, uh, what are the available uh, tools? And now, what where they fit? Uh, I mean, we know where they fit, but uh, because they will help you build uh, the cloud native apps, uh, you, you know, the Wasm based cloud native apps. But uh, what benefits it provides uh, over the standalone language? Absolutely, yeah. So uh, the the biggest thing for me is the security. Like I said, that's my background. That's the thing that uh, you know I see as the biggest benefit. Um, it's, it's extremely well-designed in that manner. Um, so no matter what language you use, whether it's Rust or C++ or you know, Swift or something else, when you compile to WebAssembly, you gain security by default. Um, and it's really compelling for a lot of people um, because you know they can lean on those security properties a little bit more, and they can feel a little bit more secure that you know they're not going to have some kind of exploit that will you know be able to gain access to their cloud provider or something like that. WebAssembly will prevent a lot, an entire class of issues in that regard. Um, the next, which I think is also very interesting, is the polyglot application. Uh, development that's available. So again, this kind of is very similar to the GraalVM uh, conversation that you had, uh, where you know if if your team is say C++ and they know C++ the best, but then they find you know a Rust library or they find you know an assembly script library that they think would better serve a particular purpose, they can use the same tooling, they can use the same application to deploy modules compiled from multiple languages together without needing to care about, you know, interoperability, uh, the, you know, having to spin up extra microservices and have to, you know, test those extra microservices and worry about the volatility of the network. And so you can have, you know, multiple languages living in the same process that can you know exchange information with each other and run application specific you know tooling and libraries without needing to do a whole lot of extra work and that's one of the things that I've been focused on is that the CLI tool for suborbital will automatically build your WebAssembly modules no matter what language they're you know built with um, right now it supports Swift and Rust, but like we'll very soon be supporting other languages as well. 
And the idea is that one command will build all of them, no matter what language they're in. And then once they've reached the WebAssembly module stage, it doesn't matter what language they came from. It's all just the same WebAssembly bytecode format. And so when the runtime loads it, it doesn't care what language it came from. It's all the same. So they can interoperate very well with each other. Um, and then this, this next thing that I think is incredibly exciting, but doesn't actually quite exist yet, so I'm going to say this is like a future thing, is uh, something that I call application decomposability. And that is, I think, for me, that is like the, the main goal. <laughs> so in the next year or so, I'm going to be working to be able to do this, which is the ability to decompose an application while it's running and move execution of particular parts to an edge network. And the, the idea here is that if you have you know, functions, you know, because uh, suborbital applications are function-based, if you have individual functions that would perform very well on an edge network, Atmo should be able to automatically figure out which functions are appropriate and push them to the edge without you as the developer needing to care where they run. And the declarative development that we're going to talk about in a minute really helps with that because you will be able to trust Atmo to run your modules in the best place where they belong. And I think this is one of the most exciting parts of it because edge computing gives us all sorts of benefits like performance and the ability to you know, have increased security and less resource utilization in our central cloud and all sorts of different things. Um, so yeah, there's, there's a number of things that are pretty exciting, but I do want to be very explicit and say that like WebAssembly and especially cloud native WebAssembly is still quite early, right? The ecosystem is still quite young. So you won't be able to do everything that you need to do. I'm hoping five years from now, you will, you know, WebAssembly, cloud native WebAssembly will be the default and you will be building all your applications with it if I have my way. Um, but right now it is still young. So I encourage you, I encourage everyone to try it out, whether it's Atmo or one of the other available you know, WebAssembly frameworks for, for cloud native development, try it out, give the maintainers feedback about what you want to be able to do with it. And so that we can inform what we're working on and give you the capabilities that you're looking to, to use. So um, yeah, that would be that would be my answer. <laughs> Yeah, I think uh, uh, these these questions, the the previous two questions that I asked, uh, would really help uh, the people who are watching and who will be watching later on uh, to understand uh, what WebAssembly is. On the first thing, uh, why it is useful, what are the use cases, uh, how to get into WebAssembly when uh, from a beginner perspective, and uh, like if you are just using a single programming language, then what benefits WebAssembly will provide you. So all these uh, these things would definitely help you get started. Uh, plus, I always get fascinated by the polyglot applications, like you know uh, the cross uh, cross languages cross cross language module use the best of different languages, best of different modules uh, that even um, uh, Thomas was talking when, when we had the Graal VM discussion. So it was really exciting that we can, you know, uh, use uh, one of the Python modules in, in the Java. So uh, which is which is exciting because uh, if there is something that you can use, which is good for a particular reason, then why not use it and why to create a separate microservice for that? So uh, that's yep. uh, uh, that's actually very exciting use case, and I think that will grow more and more uh, once uh, I mean, and that will get mature more and more, so that people can use uh, you know uh, uh, all the uh, all the modules very in in a very easy way in in a single programming language. Uh, yep. So yeah, let's let's move on, uh, Connor, with with the next uh, set that you have. Sure. Um, can we bring the slides back up? Okay, so um, the declarative development that I mentioned is, a, is an important aspect of suborbital. Now, I'll, I'll just say right off the bat that this is not specific to WebAssembly. Um, this is a concept that suborbital and particularly Atmo is introducing as a way to make WebAssembly development easier. And, um, and it pulls into the, um, the, uh, the decomposability that I spoke to earlier. Um, so the way that you build an Atmo application 
is by writing these functions, you know, you write these independent functions that each serve a particular purpose. And then we compose those functions together to build the business logic of our application. So I'm sure that, you know, a lot of the people watching this are very familiar with Kubernetes and how it introduced, uh, well, maybe not introduced, but made popular declarative infrastructure right, the concept where you describe what you want your infrastructure to look like, and then something like Kubernetes or Terraform or Ansible would make it happen without you needing to actually know what is happening under the hood. And that's similar to what we're talking about here, except it happens at the actual application level rather than the infrastructure level. So I'm hoping to introduce some of this, those similar concepts to actually writing your cloud native applications, not just deploying them. So the example that you're looking at here is a very simple application that I'm gonna talk about and like I'm gonna show you this exact application in a minute. Um, and what it is is describing the endpoints, the API endpoints that your application provides. So you can see that there are, you know, two of them defined here. One of them is asking for the stars of a particular GitHub repo. Um, and the other one is asking to send a report about a particular repo. And they are being handled by a set of steps. And those steps are the functions that you write. Uh, in suborbital, we call them runnables. And those runnables are all compiled to WebAssembly and Atmo figures it out for you. You don't need to explicitly say, I want to run this WebAssembly module on this server and you know return the result to this variable, blah, 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 blah. You don't need to specify any of those things. You just tell Atmo what to run and Atmo will figure out how to run it for you. So we're gonna dive into this and how it all works uh, during the demo. Uh, but I just want to quickly touch on, you know, some more things about the WebAssembly community and the WebAssembly ecosystem before we move on to talking more about suborbital. Um, so I like to show this slide because it shows kind of the, the, the breadth of what's happening in the WebAssembly community. So, you know, a long time ago, uh, well, two years ago in, in 2019, Solomon Hikes, who was the founder of Docker, uh, he said that if WebAssembly and WASI, the WebAssembly systems interface, uh, had existed back in 2008, it might have preempted the creation of Docker. That's how important it is. That's the quote. And so, um, you know, we can see that, you know, there, there are some really interesting implications for WebAssembly and how uh, popular it could become, how much potential it has, just based on this one tweet from two years ago. Um, and then more recently, so this was November of 2020, the Cloud Native Computing Foundation uh, listed WebAssembly as one of the five technologies to watch um, because it, like I said, very recently, it has become useful in that Cloud Native context on the server side, in addition to the web browser use cases that it is normally used for. And then, the open source community, which is you know what I consider um, myself and Suborbital a part of, they are building things for WebAssembly across multiple layers of the stack. So Suborbital lives you know at the application layer, at the actual development of your application. But there are other projects like Crustlet um, from the Deus Labs team at Microsoft that is you know, looking at orchestration of WebAssembly. So Crustlet actually integrates with Kubernetes directly to run WebAssembly modules. Um, and there are plenty of other projects out there that I encourage you to go and look at, things like Lunatic, uh, which is a, you know, an actor model, and the Wasm Cloud as well is another actor model-based project for running uh, WebAssembly, and um, all sorts of you know, open source language uh, support like assembly script and the Swift Wasm project, which is uh, what Suborbital uses to run Swift in WebAssembly. So there's a wide variety of these cloud native projects coming onto the scene that are really enhancing what you can do with WebAssembly um, in these extra browser contexts that I like to call them. Um, so that's the end of the slides. And uh, maybe one more opportunity to answer some questions before I go into the demo.
Yeah, I think it was uh, a very insightful slide, the last one that where you showed the the uh, the right growth because those are those are actually said by the leaders uh, who have built uh, the products that have changed the entire ecosystem uh, of of the cloud native, uh, you know, the cloud native community. Uh, so whatever projects uh, Connor has just mentioned, I have posted a GitHub link uh, for that on on Twitch and YouTube both. Uh, so the, the Lunate Crustlet uh, and the assembly script. Uh, so all these projects are there. Uh, I mean, uh, go have a look. I'll include that, include them in the description as well. Uh, yeah, let's let's move on to the to the demo. I think. Sure. Cool. All right. So, I am going to be using a Discord bot for this demo. So hopefully, uh, that will work well. Okay. So what you're looking at now is a an Atmo application. Um, so like I mentioned before, Atmo is kind of the batteries included uh, framework for building web uh, servers using WebAssembly. And the way it does that is by packaging a number of runnables, which are functions written in various languages, into WebAssembly modules, and then deploying what's called a bundle to run that application. So. It all starts with the directive, and that is what I showed on the slides a minute ago, which is the declarative uh, description of how your application should behave. So we've got two different endpoints defined here, and I'll walk through each one. This one is a little bit simpler, and then this one adds a couple more features, so we'll kind of go through it progressively. Um, and so to start, uh, we're defining you know, an endpoint which is the stars slash repo endpoint. It's a get request. And we're going to handle it by using this GH stars function. So if we look at that, uh, if we look at that runnable, we'll see it's a Rust runnable. And it's using what we call the runnable API to perform your application's you know, behavior. So the suborbital API or the runnable API is what I talked about earlier, where it is granting capabilities to the WebAssembly sandbox to allow you to do things that WebAssembly blocks by default because of the security properties. So these expose controlled, you know, secure capabilities uh, that your code can take advantage of. So in this case, you know, we are uh, there's the runnable definition, which is you know just a, a standard. Uh, Rust trait or interface that describes what a runnable should do, and then we have a number of these of these packages, you know, like the ability to make HTTP requests, the ability to do logging, um, that are used to actually do something a little bit more fun. So what this particular runnable does is it fetches the star the stargazer count, so the number of stars on a particular GitHub repo. That's all it does. It's quite simple, um, but it's it's a good you know. Uh, demonstration of what the runnable API is capable of doing. So since we're handling an HTTP request as part of you know, the execution of this runnable, we use the rec package to request information about the HTTP request that we're handling. Um, and so when Atmo runs this runnable, it will bind the request that's currently being handled to this runnable. So that whenever you ask for information, it will tell you something about that, that request. So in this case, we're asking for the URL parameter repo, which in our directive was defined as this wildcard right here. And then we're using that, uh, that value to make a request to the GitHub API using the suborbital HTTP package. And then we are going to simply um, deserialize the JSON into this object right here. And then we will return Stargazer's information as the result, and that's really all it is. It's, it's ten lines of code to you know perform something pretty standard. I think take some input, do an action, provide some output. Fairly straightforward. Um, and so you know, Atmo when it runs your application, it will bind capabilities to the WebAssembly module at runtime. So. WebAssembly itself doesn't understand how to do an HTTP request. WebAssembly doesn't have that capability. And so Atmo provides that capability so that when your application makes a call to do an HTTP request, Atmo knows how to handle that 
and it will do it on behalf of the WebAssembly module and then return you know, the, the information to the WebAssembly module. So that's kind of the security aspects of it. Um, and you know, the, the list of capabilities, the list of APIs that are available is growing pretty steadily. I'm adding new ones all the time. And I would love for anybody who you know, has a particular capability that they would want to be able to see, uh, just please leave a comment or leave an issue on the Atmo repository, or uh, we have GitHub discussions as well. Please feel free to let me know you know what types of things you want to be able to do, and I will definitely help you out. Um, so, you know, now that we've seen what the runnable looks like, um, we will maybe actually try to run this thing. So, um, I'll bring up the terminal here, and we're going to use the Subo CLI tool. So that's the suborbital um, command line tool, and it gives you all the things you need to build and run Atmo applications. So I'm going to tell Subo to build this project, and I'm going to tell it that I want to bundle the application, and I'm going to tell it to use the native toolchain. So Subo, by default, ships with a Docker-based toolchain. So you don't actually need to install the Rust toolchain or the Swift toolchain on your local machine. It will actually use Docker images to build your code into WebAssembly if you feel like you, you, know, you don't want to install those, those individual tools and it will keep those tools up to date for you. Um, but if you prefer to use the tools on your local machine, you can pass this native flag and it will do that. The, the, the trade-off is that native is faster, but you know, the Docker version is, is more convenient. Um, so right there, we've just built all of the runnables and you can see that you know, they are uh, compiled to these WebAssembly modules. There's one for each of the runnables, and then they get bundled into this runnables.wasm.zip file. So this contains everything that Atmo needs to run your application. It contains your directive, it contains all of your WebAssembly modules, and it also contains your static files that I'll, I'll talk about those in a minute. And so using this, this uh, zip file, you just give that to Atmo, and Atmo like I said, we'll figure it out. It will determine how to do everything for you. You don't need to care. So I'll, I'll use the Subo dev command to run a development server locally using this bundle. Um, so this just runs a local instance of Atmo. Um, but of course, you can run it you know, in production in a Docker image if you want to. Um, and so what you can see is when it starts up, it is reading our directive and is determining what API endpoints you've described, and it's setting those up to be handled by those WebAssembly modules. So if I switch over here to Postman and I make a request to localhost and I go to this stars slash suborbital slash Atmo, it's going to hit that development server and it's going to use those WebAssembly modules to get me the star count for the Atmo repo. So you can see I made that request. It returned the number of stars. Uh, it was all 200 OK. And if we take a look at the, the logging here, we can see that um, you know, our, our module was able to actually log to Atmos output using the, um, the log package from the runnable API. And you know, it, Atmo automatically ran the function you know, that, that you requested in the directive. And then it does a bunch of extra work to actually respond to the HTTP request. So it's really nice because you as the developer, you don't need to set up all of the ports and TLS and the web server and blah, blah, blah. Atmo, again, will just handle it for you and you can focus on the business logic of your application. Um, so that is sort of the simple uh, route. So let's take a look at um, one that's a little bit more involved. Um, so the second endpoint that we've defined here is a repo report. And so what this is going to do is it's actually going to take that same information that we, you know, that we got here, the stargazers information, and it's going to send a report with that information to a Discord channel as just a nice demonstration of some of the different things that we can do here. And this is going to involve the static file system uh, that I think is really cool. So this particular handler, uh, like I said, it defines this repo report endpoint. It's a post request. And we're going to compose a couple of, well, two functions here to handle this request. So 
the GH stars function. It's the same function that we used over here. So you can see that they're, they're very reusable. And we're going to use the information that the GH stars function returned to us. And we're going to use that information to send a report to Discord. So what you can see happening here is Atmo is actually allowing you to pass information between the you know, functions that are you know, that exist in your application using something called request state. So this is a an ephemeral object that gets created for every request. And when each of your functions completes and returns some information, that data gets saved into the state object. Um, and by default, you can access it just by asking, give me the output of the GH stars function. But sometimes that's a little weird. You want to give it a custom name. So the directive has what we call um, state clauses. And uh, the first one is as. Uh, so all this is really saying is I want you to run the GH stars function and I want you to save it in state as the name stargazer. So now when we go look at the send report function, uh, this is going to do something uh, here that is requesting the state for the stargazer's value. And since we saved the output of this function into the stargazer's uh, key, when we request that state, it will actually give us the value that the, G, that the first function output. And so this lets us chain multiple functions together to form logic and pass values in between them. So uh, this uh, this send report uh, runnable is uh, doing something very similar to the first one. It is you know looking up one of the URL parameters, but this time it's doing something extra, and it's actually accessing a static file. So the um, the static directory that you can see here in the Atmo project, it is um, it is bundled into uh, your bundle when you run Stubo build. So all of the files that you include in this static directory, like we could include, you know, like a uh, um, maybe a, a JS folder, and then we could, you know, create a main.js. Like we can include whatever we want and whatever structure we want inside of this static directory, and that will all be included with your bundle when you build it. And then Atmo will allow you to access any of those files using the uh, runnable API. So this is one of the things the the file module that the runnable API provides allows you to access that static file system and read any of the files that you were in, that were included. So in this case, we're storing you know a webhook URL in a file. I'm not going to show it to you because then you're going to be able to send messages to my Discord channel. Um, but you know we're going to read that file and we're going to use it to um, send an HTTP request, a post request, to that URL with our custom you know, body, um, and that will get sent to a Discord channel. So uh, we still have the, the Atmo development server running here. So if I make that request to repo report suborbital Atmo, and I hit send, uh, you'll see in the background here that you know, a new message in my GitHub channel, or sorry, my Discord channel just popped up with that information that was sent. And it was the same information that we got from the first GH stars function. So um, yeah, I hope this is a pretty decent you know, introduction demo to how Atmo works. Uh, you can imagine being able to reuse functions across many different um, you know, API endpoints. You can imagine uh, chaining uh, you know, your, your functions together with different logic. Um, to build, you know, pretty complicated um, types of business logic, and um, yeah, I, I hope maybe somebody gets excited about this and wants to go try it. So I recommend that you visit uh, atmo.suborbital.dev, which will help you yeah, get started uh, and it will guide you through the entire thing. Uh, so there are a few questions uh, in my mind right now and few from the community so uh, the first one sure. uh, let's uh, say like what what is the directory structure that you are following uh, so first uh, we have the uh, declarative yaml file the directive uh, where we define uh, the uh, the handlers uh, the type of request resource method and then the set of functions now the functions are the actual code uh, that will uh, that contains the logic 
and uh, you can yep. chain the functions uh, that that you showed in the second demo you can chain the functions as well uh, now how uh, now how to get started uh, with with this like uh, what what should be the initial steps so we have the subo uh, cli the, that is downloaded and after that how to create the directory structure for for a particular language uh, can you show that yeah absolutely so i'll make this a little bit bigger hopefully you can see all of that um, so here I will use the Subo CLI tool. This is annoyingly not the right size. Um, so I'll use the Subo CLI tool. So there's a create project command and we'll say demo and that will create the directory structure for you. So if we uh, take a look at that demo uh, environment, it will have created a directive for you and an example runnable. Um, and if you want to create new runnables, all you need to do is uh, subo create runnable and you give it a name uh, and then you'll see that it will create that for you. Um, and then, you know, the default is Rust, but if you want to create um, a Swift runnable, for example, um, we can say barbaz and then we just say lang Swift. And um, if we uh, look at, you know, what was created here, uh, sources, it has, okay, well, it's uh, quite a directory structure. You can see that it created a, a Swift runnable for you. I'll just open it right in VS Code so you can maybe see it. Um, so we can see like it created the foobar, which is a Rust runnable, and then it also created barbaz, which is a, a Swift runnable. So um, you know, Subo will automatically create these for you. It will automatically build them for you. It'll automatically create the bundle for you. It'll do all sorts of things. It'll also run that development server for you. Um, so, you know, it, it, most of it is, is automatic. Um, and then once you've created these runnables, you can pretty much do whatever you want, um, within these, um, within these run functions and the Swift, uh, the Swift library exists, it's, it's almost exactly the same as the Rust library. You can access all of those functions to do HTTP and logging and files and blah, 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 using using the Swift library. Awesome. So uh, just, to, uh, just to summarize what we have seen in the demo, um, so who, those who are watching, uh, what we are discussing about is WebAssembly. Uh, and uh, what we have seen over here is is uh, a suborbital uh, project called Atmo that uh, that helps you create the uh, cloud native applications easily. Uh, so what it does, so it it generates the it automatically uh, will generate the WebAssembly uh, the binary uh, that that can be run easily. Uh, also, it provides you uh, the uh, the flexibility or or the ease, I would say. So you would be able to easily create first the project, uh, which, which gives you the base directory structure. Uh, you can choose between uh, currently two languages, which is Rust and Swift. Uh, more to be added, obviously. And yep. uh, after that, uh, you you can define. So it's declarative approach, just like Kubernetes. So you have a YAML file here. You have a declarative file where you define uh, what all what all what are the endpoints and uh, on these endpoints, what all the functions that you want to call. Uh, and also you can define the chaining of functions. So if you want the uh, input uh, from a previous function, you can uh, just do uh, as and uh, like uh, shown in the demo. So uh, after that, you just uh, just uh, you know run your subo command uh, to get the binary uh, and it automatically does the magic and uh, you know uh, you get your bundle uh, that can be run. And uh, it's it's you can also do the native things like uh, use your native libraries or you can use the Docker version, which will uh, run. Uh, I mean, which will build everything inside, uh, inside the container and give you the uh, the binary that that you can run. So uh, all in all, I mean, uh, that's how you can get started. Uh, so you you can get started with with your uh, WebAssembly journey. Um, Plus, I would uh, encourage you to try creating a WebAssembly module without using Atmo as well, just to see the difference, uh, how easy it, it is. Because how easy it sounds right now with Atmo uh, definitely won't be easy uh, the other way around. Uh, I haven't tried myself, but uh, I mean, I have that feeling. So that's just an honest feeling that I'm sharing. I have nothing <laughs> to do with Atmo, uh, just to let you know. Uh, so uh, just want to uh, just had, had this thought in mind. So I, I shared that. Uh, so uh, but but uh, like, uh, uh, you know, Connor said, 
it's very uh, i mean web assembly is getting so much maturity and so much features added and so does the the project add more that you just have seen so probably the best way to grow an open source project is the community uh, so the, so that's why we bring uh, such things to the community so that you can try it out and you know give the feedback feedbacks are very important whether it's my show uh, my book uh, or or this particular stream or a particular open source project so without feedback nothing can help and uh, so you give the feedback and you see i mean you contribute as well uh, like if you if you want to contribute on some of the things i i definitely show sure that the team the suborbital team would be happy to help you uh, in in that uh, your uh, contribution journeys uh, so so was i able to uh, briefly uh, summarize like the the demonstration part and atmo absolutely Absolutely. Yeah, you covered everything. <laughs> okay. So there's one question uh, from the uh, community, um, which is, I think we covered it, but if you want to add more thoughts. Uh, so the question is, if one would like to prototype this, so people are already interested, uh, is there a minimum set of technologies one should learn slash know? And what metrics would be useful to collect uh, to show web assembly is impactful? Yeah, that's a great question. So, um, you know, to to learn WebAssembly and to get started with a prototype, if you just mm -hmm. want to use WebAssembly in the browser, I would suggest checking out one of the language tool chains. Those are usually the places to get started. So, <clears throat> the uh, the Rust Wasm project is the um, you know the the easiest way to start. It will walk you through you know Hello World and all of the different things that you need to do. Uh, and we'll talk about some more advanced things as well. And that will let you just get started running something in the browser. And if you want to look at the metrics to see what the impact is, you could perhaps um, write something in JavaScript. Like um, I, I always like to use cryptography as a benchmark. So you could you know, write some uh, computationally expensive function in JavaScript and then write the same function in Rust and compile it to WebAssembly and try running both of them, maybe loop and run it a, a number of times and see which one is faster. And I, I, I bet you that Rust compiled to WebAssembly will be faster than JavaScript. And then, uh, and then when you're ready to move on uh, to you know, some other projects, there is the Swift WASM um, project as well. That's really great. Um, they, again, they walk you through uh, how to set up the Swift toolchain to compile to WebAssembly. Uh, the, the team that builds Swift Wasm also has some incredibly cool projects that will allow you to build entire web applications using Swift compiled to WebAssembly. It's really quite cool. I suggest you check it out. And then there's also the assembly script um, project as well, which will uh, let you write something that is a variant of TypeScript. So it might be more uh, familiar if, you, if you're uh, coming from a web application development background. And it will also, like I said, it'll walk you through everything you need to do um, to, to make that work. Um, and then you know, uh, visit the Atmo, uh, the Atmo documentation site, so atmo.suborbital.dev. Once again, it will walk you through everything you need to do, uh, installing the Subo tool, you know, building your first application, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and uh, if you want to maybe go one level deeper, the suborbital reactor project, this is the core WebAssembly uh, scheduler that Atmo uses internally. And if you want to directly interface with those WebAssembly modules, you want to write some Go code that just calls a WebAssembly module, and you don't want to build your entire application with WebAssembly, this could be a really good route for you to take because all you need to do is import the reactor code into your Go um, application, and then you can load WebAssembly modules and run them uh, using the reactor core. So there's a bunch of different options for you if you get started. Um, a couple of other ones that I we mentioned before, but I want to highlight. Um, not uh, it's. Uh, Oh, that's not the right website. Uh, um, there's the Lunatic project, which is really great um, for building uh, WebAssembly actor patterns. There's a logo there. You just can't quite see it. And then there's also uh, Wasm Cloud, uh, which is another pretty popular 
WebAssembly server-side development framework. Um, it's, it's more similar to Atmo. Um, so there's, there's a bunch of different options for anybody who wants to get started. Awesome. So I'll include all these links in the description. So uh, nothing to worry that if you have just missed it. Uh, so I'll include all these links in the description. Uh, also, uh, Connor, you showed a Discord channel uh, in, in your demo. So is it that someone, I mean, the community can join? I mean, uh, is there a Discord channel that community can join with, uh, with your community and for the VAS summon thing? So the, the suborbital um, uh, Discord channel is not yet public. I will be doing that eventually. Um, but okay. for now, there is a there is a WebAssembly Discord that is quite active if you're interested. There's also the WebAssembly Summit uh, Discord, and there's a SwiftWASM uh, Discord as well if you're interested. Um, but specifically for Suborbital, if you go to our GitHub, um, github.com slash suborbital. We do have uh, this meta repo, and we do have a discussion forum here uh, if you want to ask any questions or um, you know submit anything, really. Awesome. So uh, so next, like, what what's the, the future? I mean, where we are headed to? Absolutely. So the, the WebAssembly uh, specification, the WebAssembly ecosystem is evolving. Uh, you know, all the time, uh, the the WebAssembly spec is gaining more functionality. Um, so I mentioned briefly the WASI specification, which is the WebAssembly system interface, and that is going to be um, doing a lot of the similar things that I talked about with what Atmo allows you to do, which is um, securely giving capabilities to WebAssembly. But this will be a standardized uh, version of what I've built, and I do plan on using WASI when it is more mature. Um, so there are things like that that will directly benefit people developing with WebAssembly. And then there's, of course, just a bunch of work being done under the hood to make WebAssembly you know, even more performant, even easier to, for compilers to support. So there's things like interface types and module linking that will just you know, improve the spec and make it more you know, awesome than it already is. Um, and I, I fully expect that over the next year or two, we will see much more, um, you know, development of these frameworks and these, you know, the, the tooling that is available that will just make it easier because, you know, I, I spent a lot of time, uh, and I know the other projects have as well, making it really easy to get started because I think that is the most important thing to increase the adoption of WebAssembly is lowering the barrier of entry just to, to build your first hello world. Because you know, even, even a year ago, it was very difficult. Like when I first started working with WebAssembly, it was very difficult to just get that hello world even running. And we've made big like progress since then. Um, so the more that the tooling and the frameworks can do to make it simpler, provide more capabilities, et cetera, like these are all things that are going to be happening over the next you know, two, three, five years. And like I said, hopefully, like if I have my way, or if any of these projects have their way, you'll be building cloud native applications with WebAssembly left, right, and center. Um, and and one thing that we didn't even touch on, but I think is really important to mention, is that you know since WebAssembly is so portable, um, and if we kind of extend the concept of application decomposition that I that I touched on, you could imagine deploying an application that is comprised of many WebAssembly modules, have some of them running in your central cloud, have some of them running on an edge network, and then you could even imagine some of them being downloaded into the user's device to be run right there on the web page or in a mobile app or something like that. And so the possibilities there are really exciting. We haven't really gotten that far yet, but I do think that there's a, there's a future in which we could have cloud native applications spread across many layers of you know, the infrastructure extending all the way into a user's device and you know, creating a really awesome um, capability for, for cloud native developers. Yeah, I think uh, uh, that's pretty interesting uh, to see the ecosystem that is growing. So uh, Kubernetes have, uh, you know, did grow in a, in a kind of a similar fashion. Uh, if you go uh, five years back, it was not uh, as easy to spin up the clusters or create the clusters as it is easy today. So as the tool chains are there today, the, the all the, you know, the bootstrapping tools that are there, there to create the cluster. Similarly, like, like Connor mentioned, it was, wasn't easy to even write a Hello World program 
a few years back. Uh, so you can see now it has grown to a stage where you can, where you have tools like uh, 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 like Atmo. We have just seen that can you know that is bootstrapping the application and and giving you the the end result uh, in a very short amount of time. So uh, seeing always seeing this growth uh, gives the confidence that uh, yes, this product I mean this technology is you know uh, definitely worth checking and worth spending time on. Uh, so that because this will be uh, definitely something uh, big in future, uh, which will be like kind of default standards for some of the things and uh, people will be widely adopting across various huge projects. Uh, so definitely this this uh, excites me uh, and definitely I'm sure that it will be helpful for the community. And uh, this was, I think, a very, very insightful talk for the people who want to get and have a lot of questions and uh, uh, people have seen the demo uh, how how it works at least they they should be able to reach at that stage after seeing this video uh, so I, i'm very excited and i'm definitely going to try uh, uh, using the simple atmo one and not the uh, default one uh, so let's see how well it goes uh, yeah, thank you all for joining. Uh, uh, we have discussed uh, almost uh, whatever we thought of. Uh, unless uh, Connor, you have anything else to cover? No, I think we've we've touched on everything, and uh, really appreciate you having me on to to talk about Cloud Native WebAssembly. Yeah, uh, thank you. And uh, so so subscribe to the channel for for future streams and even the Twitch. Uh, so who are watching on Twitch, you can uh, just uh, there as well uh i mean that always motivates uh, us to do more when people ask questions there is a lot of interaction that helps uh and uh, bringing these uh you know these technologies uh to you uh and obviously i learn a lot community learns a lot and we are that's how we grow so th that's why it's let's learn together every time and subscribe to the channel i recently wrote a book on uh, a kubernetes ck certification just posted the link of that if you're interested in ck certification check that book out and uh, yeah that's it thank you connor for joining us today uh, and uh, spending your time in explaining us WebAssembly, how to build an application with awesome demo flawless uh, which work live and uh, i mean uh, i love when live demos work flawlessly so thank you for that <laughs> yeah. uh, uh, so uh, Thank you all, and we'll see you in the next stream. Uh, you want to say bye to the audience? Yes, bye, bye, Goodbye. everyone. Goodbye. Thanks for coming. Stay, yeah, stay here for a second. I'll end the broadcast. Bye all.